You're watching us right now, ladies and gentlemen, from a very historic place, not too far from Buena Park, where our headquarters and our studio is, is a old-fashioned town of Orange, California, and it's old-fashioned in the sense that it's got a town square and a town circle, and so when you come into this little town, you, the only way to get through town is to go around the circle, one quarter round, half round, three quarters round, or all the way around, and you're back to where you started. And on that circle, just as you go in there, headed almost due west there, uh, you will see a drugstore, an old-fashioned drugstore that was uh, here in 1889, I think it is. Let me double check here. Yeah, 1899, excuse me, 1899, and we are at the infamous Watson Drugstore, and they have the traditional pharmacy uh, that's been here over 100 years, and it's right on the street. We're sitting outside uh, at the Sidewalk Cafe. They have a soda fountain inside and so forth. So we're at the infamous and famous Watson I'm looking at a little newspaper they had, uh, the 100th year uh, celebration, and that goes back a few years, but they have celebrated more than 100 years, and uh, you'll find all kinds of things in that paper. In fact, the matter is, if you would like to get a copy of that paper, I'm sure they would make it available to you, but if not, I'll make it available to you. They have them, and I could get them. And if you would like to have one of them, well, please send me an email. And uh, the editing and design of this was Geo Design and Publishing and the articles researched by uh, Judy Ann uh, Triglia. Now, uh, we want to give credit where credit is due, and there is a very nice uh, little newspaper kind of effect, 100 years of this very great uh, drugstore. Now, we're not going to talk much more about the drugstore other than to say that uh, uh, many of you know that my daughter and granddaughters are involved in showbiz, and uh, no matter what we're doing, uh, we say the show must go on. So we're doing a live broadcast right here from Watson's famous drugstore. And uh, we're going to be talking tonight, though, not really about the drugstore as much as we're talking about America and the need for America to pray. That's what the Congressional Prayer Conference is all about. Many of you watched us the other night when we were on television live from our town, which is just a few miles away, about 15 miles away, uh, the city of Buena Park, California. Now, we talked about someone uh, at that meeting that we're going to talk about tonight, and uh, I want to uh, put her on in just a moment and introduce her, and then we'll talk to her. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Trish. Trish, um, we talked about you the other night at City Council, and I need to tilt this up here just a little bit so we get a little bit better picture. There we go. And that other lady over there, that good-looking blonde that's with me, <laughs> Do not put a rumor out that the pastor is riding around with good-looking women, even though that would be the truth. This is one of them. This is the daughter of that good-looking blonde that was over there. And so if you want to accuse the pastor of traveling with good-looking women, I am guilty. However, <laughs> we're going to get back to the serious side of the show at this point. Uh, Trish, uh, you live in Buena Park. Um, I want you to tell us a little bit about your most recent history, so to speak. I don't mean in Buena Park, but prior to coming back to Buena Park, where were you located? Um, I was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. I was a diesel mechanic for 4th Brigade 2nd ID. Um, my job was to go out there and fix the trucks um, if they were blown up or broken down and recover them. See, now you know why I have her with me. Not only because she's good looking, but because if my car breaks down, she's a good mechanic. Uh, I am. Uh, so I'm pretty good at it, too. <laughs> amen. Amen. Well, I sell with that uh, to be a little silly, but at the same time, she served in the United States Army. Okay. And I remember when her mom and her came to our 
church. We do, as many of you know, have a shelter, a refuge, uh, but mainly a church. And they came to our church. And Mom, her mom Brenda, came to know the Lord. Uh, Trish, Patricia came to know the Lord. And shortly thereafter, uh, Patricia decided that maybe, sorry, Mom, <laughs> maybe the Lord was calling her into the army. And so he did, and and she went down and signed up. Tell us a little bit about your experience in the army, would you please? Um, I don't know what to say, honestly. Um, it was an honor serving. Um, if I could do it again, I would. Um, well, let me ask you this. Let, let me, because I know you're you're a very shy and a very uh, humble lady. But let me do. Let me do, be my usual pushy self and say, <laughs> how long were you in the army? Um, five years. Five years. Yeah. And yeah. and give us a, what I believe they call it the MOS. I was a 91 Bravo and a 91 Sierra. My job, uh, I was a wheel vehicle mechanic, and then I got a specialty job as a striker repair mechanic. Um, and basically, my job was to go out there and uh, go with the line units and uh, fix their trucks as needed. Um, that included going on missions with them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking not about going around countryside here in the U.S. We're talking about Iraq. That's correct. I, uh, needless to say, our all of our listening audience knows that that's not the best place to be. If somebody wanted to go on vacation, I guarantee you they wouldn't go to Iraq. I mean, the sunsets are beautiful, but no, I yeah. don't go there. <laughs> yeah. So while you were in Iraq doing your job, serving your country, being a patriotic girl, lady, uh, I, uh, member of the U.S. Army, you yes. did your job. Tell us on that uh, particular day what happened uh, to you on that day. What happened? Um, I believe it was May 20th. Um, I ended up getting medevaced from Baghdad. But wait a minute. Why, um, why were you medevaced? I was injured. Um, and how were you injured? <laughs> Did you have a wreck? Well, how, how were you injured? Um, basically, there was uh, incoming sirens going off and um, the mortar started landing, and I was working on a truck, and as I was egressing off my truck, um, one landed very close to me, and I ended up going one way, and my leg stayed, and basically I ended up um, with torn muscles and tendons in my left leg. Um, I had plastic burns. I had a brain injury that was not diagnosed until way later. Um, and a back injury, which at the time was, you know, misdiagnosed uh, until I learned later that it was much more severe. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line of this all, and I don't mean to make a, a, a big issue of it, but here, here's a young lady, a young lady in the military, in the Army, doing her job, and she was wounded in Iraq. Uh, you heard about the wounds, uh, they're pretty severe. But fortunately, uh, she did not go the same way that some of her friends did, that is, uh, in their life. So you lost six friends. Six of my battle buddies, yes. Six of her buddies uh, are not with us any longer because they paid the ultimate price. But Trish paid a pretty severe price herself. As she said, she had a, a leg injury and burns and uh, uh, flesh wounds and, and uh, then some uh, brain damage. And she is still suffering. Uh, today, just before we came here, uh, UPS uh, delivered a package. This is quite often the case at our church. And uh, when I saw Trisha's name on it, uh, I took the package, signed for it, and took it to her. And you would have thought I was Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> because she was so happy yeah. that she got that package. And she said, oh, that's just what I was waiting for. Now, this was not a gift from a boyfriend. This was not a gift from a family. What did you receive today? I got my vision back. Um, it's been so long since I've been able to see uh, that it was such an amazing feeling getting those glasses on. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, what she's talking about in far getting her vision back, she did have vision, but she had very poor vision due to the damage done in Iraq, and uh, I could not see very well, and we're going to talk more about that in a minute, 
uh, because she suffered uh, as a result of that in our own little town. But she did have glasses, yes. but they were not the right prescription oh, no. uh, because her uh, brain problem that was causing her vision problem. By the way, she does have brain damage, but it's not uh, in cognizant dissonance. It is not in reasoning. It has to do primarily with her vision. And because she's very sharp, uh, very uh, emotional at times, like anybody would be, but at the same time, uh, her main damage was to her eyes. And here, for a long time, she's had very poor vision, seeing double, not being able to see clear. And so they finally, the Army, the government, said, okay, we're going to get you some new glasses. Yeah, they uh, sent me to see a specialty clinic that's called the Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic um, and Holly Tri Clinic. They are a group of amazing people. Um, they sent me to a neurologist, and they actually said, well, you're seeing in double miss. And <laughs> they said I had more damage to my right eye, um, and so it was causing me to see in double. Um, I basically couldn't see without my glasses. I would walk into things, and I was telling this to my doctor, and she immediately sent me to the neurologist who is also an optometrist, and um, she and I sat there going around for about an hour and um, finally got it correct, and I mean, you know, she, it's a miracle what she did. Yeah. Well, I can relate just slightly to this, not because I was wounded or anything, but because I am uh, progressing in age, and in a few days I'll be uh, 71 years of age, and with, the, with that came deterioration of my vision yeah. and so I had to have glasses life changing and it was life changing and I remember getting my first glasses and uh, but remembering that I'd been having trouble seeing and I remember you talking about receiving that package today I was on a trip a couple of years ago and I have two pair of glasses and uh, I uh, I was on this trip and uh, uh, I usually carry an extra pair of glasses in case I lose them or they break. Yeah. And so I had an extra pair of glasses in my briefcase, I thought. But I remember on that trip, my glasses were damaged and I couldn't see very well. I couldn't read anything hardly. And uh, I thought, oh, I've got to get back to my hotel. I've got to get to my suitcase. I got to my suitcase, and I remember thinking, oh, no, Wiley, I hope you packed them. <laughs> I hope they were in the suitcase. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, if I left those at home, I'm in deep trouble because I, it was on the weekend, nowhere to get glasses. And so I remember digging through my luggage, and when I saw that glass case, <laughs> what a relief. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I can see again. So I took my extra pair out, and I was able to see. Now, when I got back home, I got the second pair fixed and so forth. But I can remember how excited I was about finding that I had packed my glasses. Yeah. And I saw even increased, uh, you know, excitement today when I had, I, did, I had no idea what was in the package, yeah. uh, you know, but I handed her the package. And it was as if, as I said, I was Santa Claus because she knew what it was. <laughs> she knew it was her vision, that is her glasses, and she yeah. was able to have these. That was actually quite quick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the lady promised she was going to do her very best, and it's the VA, and I know they try, but there's so many other soldiers besides me. Well, there's a lot of other soldiers, and plus, everybody knows the government sometimes moves a little slower than others. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, what an exciting day today, before we came over here, she got her glasses and, quote, got her vision back, <laughs> and so... She's been in a much better mood. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I would yeah. say so. <laughs> Amen. Now, uh, the bottom line, though, is, folks, that's part of the problem. Now, just a few days ago, just a few days ago, uh, Trish was out uh, to get some exercise, which the doctor suggested. Yeah, um, biking is the only way that I can exercise. I can't do impact. Mm -hmm. I can barely walk most days or get out of bed so... Biking is something that makes me feel alive again. So she went out uh, nearby our church over into a, a business park kind of place that was most of the businesses except for maybe the ice cream joint were closed yeah. down. Yeah, the ice and, cream and so it was a good place to go and bike because, ladies and gentlemen, we live in Southern California. 
And I wouldn't dare try to ride a bike on the street. I'm it's sorry. It's dangerous. It's way it's too dangerous. dangerous. So, she was over in this uh, area of, uh, of businesses uh, doing her bike riding. And in all honesty, she did not have her new glasses yet. No, no, I, w I didn't have any glasses at the time. So, so tell us what happened there. You became a little disoriented. What happened? Um, I was biking down this uh, alleyway um, in the industrial complex. And I got to the end, and it got really dark for me. And so out of fear, I turned around. Um, I had PTSD, and uh, I was blind. And so that fight or flight mode kicked in for me. And I just turned around. And I started going as fast as I could the other way. And the next thing you know, I'm being surrounded by cops. The police department, Buena Park Police Department, uh, then, the, here's a lady who is a 27-year-old wounded veteran uh, having some PTSD symptoms, disorienting her, blinding her, and so she's obviously disoriented. She wasn't drinking, she wasn't doping, she was disoriented because she's a wounded Iraqi vet, and so... The Buena Park Police Department, how many officers were there? Oh, God, there was um, four. Four police officers then surrounded her. With the lights on. Uh, with the lights on, scaring her even worse. Tell us a little bit about what happened then. Um, well, they did the classic good cop, bad cop. One was trying to be nice to me, and then the other pulled me aside and very aggressively told me, he's like, you understand we could arrest you right now. And I was confused as to why I even got stopped. He said I was trying to run from them, and I was like, I, I think you're misunderstanding what happened. Uh, I tried to explain to him that um, because I have a brain injury, I can't see too well. And um, I was scared when I got to the end of the alleyway, so I decided to turn around. I didn't even know there was a cop there. And, uh what were some of the other comments that the officers made when you tried to explain to them that you were a wounded vet and, and that the reason was that you were running from them or running from something other than the fear of not being able to see? What were their comments to you at that point? Um, this officer who would not tell me his last name or badge number uh, said that you know, he was basically discrediting my military service. He um, basically narrowed it down to, oh, we all get, you know, a little uh, hearing loss and claim it at the end of our service. And I looked at him and I said, well, with all due respect, sir, I didn't have a choice. I was honorably and medically retired from the U.S. Army. I didn't claim it or want to claim it. Um, I was told. And that's the difference. And I felt so disrespected when he started treating me like that. Uh, well, what else did he say, comment-wise, if you can remember about what he said in reference to you either being or not being a veteran? Um, he just didn't want to listen to me. Um, he, to him, like, I was trying to explain to him that uh, he was, because he was shining this flashlight in my eyes and disorienting me even more. And um, I was trying to explain to him, sir, can you please stop doing that? I have a brain injury, and I, I didn't want to, like, do something I would regret later. You know, he was being kind of aggressive towards me, and so I um, you know, was trying to explain to him, you know, what had happened to me in hopes that he would, you know, understand and, you know, back off a little bit. And, uh, and ladies working. and gentlemen, um, I am a resident of the city of Buena Park. Oops, just had a little accident over here on the street, I believe. We just had an accident right out here, right on the street, close to where we're at. And, and Trish is going to the rescue. Yeah, you know. So go ahead and stay with her. I'll continue on here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I said, I am a resident of the city of Buena Park. And I am a 27-year veteran of the city of Buena Park, and I've known Trish now for more than five years, about seven or eight years. Uh, what happened to you?
and I know her to be a very logical person, even with the wounds that she had and received there in uh, uh, Iraq. And uh, she has reacted here today, literally, <laughs> as a soldier. In her mind, there was an attack. <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, controlled enough to know that it was a fender bender. I don't know how serious it was, but there is, as I said, a circle here in town. And if someone came around that circle, someone wasn't watching, and there indeed was a fender bender, an accident of sorts. But again, immediately, immediately, uh, Patricia, Trish, as we know her, jumped to her feet and went there to be a part of the rescue and uh, I, I'm hoping she'll be back shortly and we can get her back on the air and I'm hoping we'll find out that there was no one injured in this uh, accident that occurred there but we'll find we'll find that out uh, in a little bit but I as a 27 year veteran of the Buena Park residency as a member of the community I came here in 1987 to Buena Park to be the pastor, and I still am the pastor and rabbi, pastor and rabbi of um, the First Southern Baptist Church and Messianic Fellowship. And uh, we have had some battles in town, but uh, I am a good citizen. In fact, I ran for city council a number of years ago. I did not win because there was a lot of people running that were probably better qualified than me. But at any rate, uh, I did run for city council. And, uh, uh, but uh, I am very, very embarrassed to say that I am a resident of the city of Buena Park because of the way the Gestapo tactics that our police department uh, demonstrated. Now, the other night I said that, and council member, council member Art Brown said that was not true. Well, the tactics that were used on Patricia, the verbal tactics and the tactics later that happened, I think you'll see, was indeed Gestapo-type tactics. Oh, now, you. before we go back into your story, <laughs> uh, you just sprung to the rescue. Was that a fender bender? Um, that was the one that angry saw. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was truck versus SUV. Unfortunately, the SUV did not win. Okay. Um, but everybody was okay, and I just had to go over there and make sure because I would rather see somebody's life than just sit there and watch. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what transpired in Buena Park was nothing less than Gestapo tactics. In fact, one of them even made a comment that she did not have proof that she was a veteran. Therefore, she was not a veteran. Yeah. The Gestapo used to say, well, I'm sorry, Pastor, but I had a backpack full of proof. I had every VA medical record in there. Um, I had my prescriptions in there. Um, literally every possible proof they wanted or could ever ask for was in that backpack. Now, she had this backpack, folks, yeah. and you know what a backpack is. It's not something that you just hang on to like a purse. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's on your shoulders. It's strapped yeah. to you. And what did they do then? Did they say, please take off your backpack? No. The cop said we could do this the easy way or the hard way. And he looked at me with this like menacing like glare. And then he so grabbed he said, it we off can my... do this. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. And so then what happened? Uh, he grabbed it off of my back and uh, proceeded to just go through it. He dumped everything out of that backpack. I mean, he was searching hard for, I don't even know. But, um, I, you know, he's like, is there anything in here? And I was like, well, I have my prescription pills from the VA, sir. And that immediately, you know, was a tactic for him to, you know, are you under the influence of anything right now? And I was like, well, what do you consider under the influence, sir? Because, I mean, yes, I do take my medications like I'm supposed to. <laughs> um, but that's for your benefit. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. You know, and with all due respect, I mean, I Amen. didn't say that to him. But no, no, really I'm it sure. is, you know. Like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, if she's under the uh, influence of her medication just because the doctor has prescribed yeah. it and because she wants to stay normal I mean, uh, and not get abnormal. It's hard and, to pinch, but... <laughs> yeah. And, um, uh, so they, they took your backpack off you, not asking you to take it off, 
but dumping it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Art Brown, the council member, can say, I'm falsely accusing the police department of Gestapo tactics. But let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. If a police officer literally jerks your pack off your back and says we can do it the easy way or the hard way and dumps the bag upside down looking for who knows what, that is Gestapo tactics. That's not normal police tactics. I don't care how long they've been a policeman. That is not normal police tactics. And a matter of fact, if you were to ask the chief of police, if you were to ask most officers, they would say, if that is what happened, and they would specify yes, that, of course. if that is what happened, that would be wrong. Now, they wouldn't say it was Gestapo, but I say it's Gestapo yes, because I, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, they have integrity right. and they have no problem admitting when I'm wrong, but to be treated like that when I haven't done yeah. a thing to these people is it's horrible. Now, at this point, ladies and gentlemen, she is into this event to the degree that uh, she has been criticized, she has been scared, she's had bright light shine in her face, she's yeah. been told she doesn't have her papers, and she's been treated like a common criminal, and she is not. She was not under the influence of anything illegal, she was not drinking or doping, and she was only a little disoriented. And people say, well, yeah, but the cops thought. I don't care what they think. That does not justify Gestapo tactics. No. Now, at that point, they've gone through, they've jerked your bag off you. They said, we'll do it the easy way or the hard way, whatever that means. And then they... Yeah, uh, right after he did that, Pastor, is when he started administering the bill of writing um, and, and he said, okay, so he now says, I'm going to administer a field sobriety test. He starts shining a light in my face and, you know, starts asking me to do this. Well, he's doing this in my eyes and uh, with a light, not even actually correctly, you know, doing it. I explained to him, I was like, sir, you're expecting something, to, a react, some sort of reaction with that light. Um, you're going to get one, but I have a brain injury. And he started laughing and, and you know, and... Uh, kind of okay, now, after the field yeah, sobriety test, know. then what happened then? What did they do then? Did they say, okay, you're obviously not under the influence and let you go? What happened? They wrote me a ticket because they weren't going to let me leave without something. Now, folks, let me, let me interrupt you here and say we don't want to use their street terms necessarily, but they issued you a citation. Yes, they did. That's what a ticket is. They issued you a citation. Now, why did they? What was the reason for the issue of the citation? What did it say? Well, after telling them I was homeless at the time, um, they wrote me a ticket for a bicycle license. But, and the rule is basically, if you're a resident of Pointe Park, you have to have a, a bicycle license. Um, my question to them was, I just told you guys I was homeless. And my next thing was, how did they know I had a bicycle license or not riding high? That was the reason for pointing, you know, for pulling me over supposedly. Because at this point, I had kind of gotten a little bit level-headed. And I was like, wait, why did you guys stop me in the first place? Because I didn't have a bike. So they issued you a citation and a subpoena to show up in court because you... Uh, were in violation of a city ordinance in Buena Park that says all residents must have a license for their bicycle. And they said you did not have one, but they failed to mention that you did not have a uh, residence either. That's correct, but, uh And so now you have a ticket, and you have a court date coming up, and you have to go to court. Not uh, now, two. I'm sorry? Not now, remember? Well, yeah. the, um, I'm still going to go because oh, I yeah. know how yeah. these people are. I'm, oh, yeah. There's no way I'm not going to Well, the reason that, that mom, in fact, let's put let's put mom on. Let's get mom on. Hi. What, what mom is talking about is, is that um, in case the one city council man, Art Brown, yeah. said uh, I was wrong to accuse them of Gestapo tactics and so forth, and he took up for the police. They don't do that in Buena Park. Well, they did. You just heard the story. Now, yeah. at that point, though, the meeting then was over, 
And uh, Brenda, tell our listening audience what happened after the city council meeting. Well, um, it was kind of nice because um, Beth Swift came up to me, and she was the uh, mayor. She's not no more. She's um, Steve Barry is now, but. Um, me and her have been texting back and forth, me praying for her. She goes to a lot of meetings that I go to to help the city of Buena Park and help solve the homeless situation somehow. So we're trying to still working on that. But the day, the evening that this happened, I texted her right away and I told her what was going on. And she, it really disturbed her to know that this was going on with my daughter. And she told me to follow. Uh, you know, against the police, you know, she wanted me to follow a report against them and said that was wrong for what they did and I should follow a report against them, me and my daughter both, because it's not the first time, no. you know, but, um, mm. anyway, so she, her and, and um, uh, was it Fred? Yeah, no. The mayor. No, the other guy that came up to me. Anyway, we'll okay. get to that. Anyway, she came up to me and she, um, asked me for the ticket. She asked me if I had the ticket on me and I said, yes, I do. And she asked me for it. And she said she was going to pay for it. And now, I, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me just jump in here for a minute. Now, see, here, here's the circumstance. The city council member, Art Brown, said what I was doing was wrong and accusatory and so yeah. forth, and I shouldn't have done it, and that the police in Buena Park are not Gestapo. Yeah. And yet here, another city council woman, yeah. uh, she didn't say that to me, no. What she did was she went to this mother of this daughter and said, give me the ticket, I'll pay for it. Right in front of everybody. Now, if the ticket was so justifiable, if the ticket were so righteous, why would a city council member who was a mayor several times herself, yes. why would she say, I'll pay for that ticket? She obviously felt like they had some problems. Yes. You know what? Yeah. I find it so funny that, you know, their reason for giving me a ticket was for a bicycle license. I mean, with all due respect, Pastor, I also didn't have any lights on my bike at the time. Um, so common sense would be, there is your first thing, not a bicycle license. That yeah. is just silly. Yeah. That, Absolutely. I mean, and, you know, I can completely agree with Pastor when he says that um, they're using Gestapo like tactics. Um, I have had an officer tell me, you're under our um, authority now, we can do what we want. Yeah. And that's scary. Yeah. That is absolutely scary because... Well, um, you see, that's what uh, happened. Uh, that's why I use the term Gestapo, yeah. because I'm a, a student, not a very smart one, but I am a student of history, and I know that the police called the Gestapo in Germany, uh, use the same kind of tactics. You're under us, you must do what we say now. Doesn't matter right or you wrong. You, you must do it, you work for us, and what we say is what you have to do. Now, at that point now, see, here is another city council member saying, give me the ticket, I'll pay for it. Now, also, I believe the mayor uh, Mr. Barry approached you in reference to the ticket as well. Uh, yes, they, yes, and that was quite nice too. Um, also, to thank my daughter for her service and to let her know that we appreciate that. And if we have any more problems, um, I was given two cars, so I'm going to keep one of them on me. One I gave my daughter, and they let me know if anything's happened, please call right away because they they know they're having problems. And, you know, not with all of them, but with few, and they even admitted that right there, you know, both of them. Now, um, I think it's great that they, because they're really, you know, caring about the city. I know Beth is. She's a, a doll, you know, and always cares for that. She don't want to see nothing happen to our child. As a matter of fact, at one of our meetings, she, quote, I would love to see more churches open their doors like we do, you know, and get these people and give them help and give them a chance again. Amen. And let, me, know? let me jump on that just for a minute because of, of, of what transpired, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, all of you know that we run a homeless shelter. Brenda is the cook there and the dorm mom, and her daughter helps there and works yeah. there. And they're a very integral part of helping people in our community. Now, I say all of that to say this is that uh, we uh, help the poorest of the poor. Yeah. And we're a small church. 
we're we're working like crazy to try to reach a hundred <laughs> on Sunday, you know. Oh, yeah. So that tells you the size of our church. We're not a huge mega church with a lot of money, no, and so we struggle now. In that struggle over the years, I've been pretty frugal. And I began to realize that because we were being donated a lot of food that Brenda distributes and feeds us, that we were getting a lot of cardboard. A lot of boxes were coming in. And and one of the fellows came to me and said, Pastor, can I have that cardboard? We had a big stack of it. Uh-huh. And I said, sure, get it out of here. It's trash. And so he took that cardboard. And one of the guys came up to me and said, Pastor, that cardboard's worth a lot of money. Uh, he's going to recycle that. I said, well, more power to him. Praise God. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I got to thinking, wait a minute. Maybe we should recycle our cardboard. So we recycle our cardboard. We recycle and, and our bottles. And, and our cans. bottles and our cans. And what we do with that money uh, is to buy gasoline for our vans and to, uh, for the two vans that were donated to us, by the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, the gasoline is paid for by much of the cardboard that we yeah. recycle. Well, I say all of that to say in reference to Beth Swift, who was a former mayor. Uh, after all of this event the other night and after we were there, she said to me, oh, by the way, Pastor, very quietly, she said, oh, by the way, Pastor, I brought some cardboard by today. Uh-huh. So she... Yeah. said it wasn't a whole lot, but I want to help. And I said, look, when that trailer is filled, we get about 350 to $400 yeah. for that filled trailer of scrap cardboard. And we have one of the correspondents from my TV show, Peter Maxson, who makes sure that every box is flat and, and no ridges so that we can get a lot in that trailer. <laughs> yeah. And Beth... Here is a lady who is a member of the city council. She didn't know this was going to happen. She wasn't trying to set anything up. She just wanted to help us in any way she could. And one of the ways to help was to bring cardboard so we could recycle it. That's the kind of council people that we have there uh, in Buena Park. Good afternoon, sir. Can I help you? Uh, Yes, sir. Um, Pardon me. I was just wondering if you agree with I'd like to give donation to help our battle against modern day slavery tonight, if you can. Help in modern day. Uh, so no, uh, well, she, she we're, trucking. we're we're doing a uh, live television show right now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, but we'd be glad to talk to you after. We'll be off here in a few minutes. Oh yeah, please, yeah, go for it. All right. Okay. We were All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, that gives you an example of one of the uh, council members of our city. Uh, a lady who uh, wanted to help, yeah. Yeah, and in absolutely. a small way, but help. And that's how we do what we yeah. do. Uh, and, okay, uh, Trish, you had something else you want to share? Yeah, uh, when me and my mother came to that church many, many, many years ago, we were what people might, you know, want to say hopeless. Um, we were just out of control. And Riley Drake and his church, were the only people that gave us a chance. And if it wasn't for that chance, I wouldn't have gotten to serve. I wouldn't have gotten to do anything but be a nobody. Amen. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Caller, are you there? (laughs) Yes, I am, Pastor. I did turn the 712, and I was not having any luck. Okay, is this Peter? Yes, sir, it sure is. Well, Peter, I'm doing an interview right now with uh, two friends of yours, uh, Tricia and Brenda. And uh, uh, Peter Maxson is one of the guys that is also a former homeless man who uh, came to our church not to get food, uh, not to get assistance, but came to our church to commit suicide. And the reason he came to a church was so his body would be taken care of by the church. That was how many years ago? Uh, that was about eight years ago, Pastor. Uh, we're at yeah. the same time. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Hello. And that was about eight years ago, about the same time that yeah. Trish was just talking about, that she and her mom came in off the streets yeah. and uh, out of a very sinful life to a walk with Jesus Christ. Uh, Trish, anything else you'd like to share? Uh, just uh, want to 
wanted to say thank you because of people like you, I can now say that I served honorably in the military, and that's an honor yes. that I would have never had if it wasn't for somebody like you. Well, thank you. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I want to pick up on something here. Obviously, I'm very humbled by this sweet lady and her mom and Peter and others that say thank you. Uh, because it, I know it's not me doing it, it's the Lord. Uh, but I sure am glad I have a chance to be a part of it. But, you know, one of the other things that uh, draws, a while ago we were talking about this Gestapo-type situation. Uh, and I want to bring up something that I wonder if it was a coincidence or it just happened. You see, I went to city council shortly after Trish's event about getting the citation. And I went to the city council, and they have a time, five minutes, where any citizen can speak their mind. And so I spoke my mind that I felt like that that was a wrong thing to do. And please don't do it again. Now, at that point, uh, within five days, within five days after I made that appeal, I received a letter from the city of Buena Park. Code enforcement, neighborhood improvement, <laughs> automobile. They came, They wanted to come over and do an inspection and to check us out. Now, we try to be as clean and as safe oh, yeah. as we can. But ladies and gentlemen, we're not perfect. And uh, we do make mistakes and we'll make others. But the bottom line <laughs> is we have this man here, Peter, that tries to keep uh, the trash cleaned up and picked up. We do have some old vehicles. We have a vehicle there that's uh, several years old, uh, but it's the only thing that guy has in this world. And uh, to take it away from him and make him get rid of it has just not been my desire at this you know, point. Um, and to be honest, well, 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 Pastor, I have a story that I'm sure Tricia would appreciate. Um, and it's a feel-good story, so if if you're ready, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and I, share I, that story I, with us. Peter shared, well, by the way, we had happened. Peter. Before you share that, let me remind our audience that uh, uh, we do breaking news stories quite often, long before the other news media gets a hold of them. And yesterday, Peter called in with a breaking news story that all of you have seen now. But we broke it. Peter broke it right here on the Whitey Drake Show. And it was about two firemen that were cleaning the windows on the new uh, World Trade Center in New York. And the scaffolding broke. And they were dangling 60-some-odd floors above the ground, about to go to their death, in all honesty. In fact, one of them had his cell phone, called his wife and said, Honey... I don't think I'm going to be home tonight. But more than 100 New York firemen went inside the building with diamond cutters and cut a big eight-foot hole in the window and took those guys scaffolding and all in the building and saved their life. And you heard that broke on this station by Peter Maxson. Now, Peter, do you have another story for us? Yes, and this story comes out of the great state of Texas, and this is a feel-good story, and it has to do with an entertainer by the name of Garth Brooks, okay. who uh, I'm sure um, pretty much all of your listening audience has heard of. There was a 47-year-old woman who happened to go to a Garth Brooks concert that is battling breast cancer. She was about 12 rows back and had a big cardboard sign, and on the sign it said, Chemo this morning, Garth Brooks tonight, gonna have a, gonna have just a great day. Well, halfway into the concert, two ushers came up to her and said, um, your presence is requested at the front of the stage. <laughs> and she kind of stood there. She was bewildered and said, well, I don't understand what you mean. And they said, Garth Brooks has asked for you to come to the edge of the stage. And, of course, hearing something like, well, that kind of put her in dreamland. She found herself at the foot of the stage. He 
had found out about a particular song that she is holding. He went ahead and sang it for her, and while he was singing it, they showed her sign on a big screen, TV, and of course she got a big loud applause for that. But what people didn't know was that Garth Brooks' parents both had passed away due to cancer. Yes. And when he got done with the song, he reached around and handed her his guitar as a gift. Oh, wow. oh my goodness, my goodness. Well, Peter, thank you for that story. That is indeed a feel-good story here on the Wiley yeah. Drake Show, and we love those. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sometime back I was at a meeting with some other people, and I'll not drop a lot of names, simply to say Garth Brooks was one of them. And in that meeting, he shared, he shared with the rest of us that the only way, the only way he could deal with the tragedy that occurred in his family in what you referred to, he said, the only way I could deal with that is because of Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know how anybody can deal with tragedy without Jesus Christ. Right. And Garth Brooks made it very clear that he too, just like Trish, just like Brenda, came to a point and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so thank you, Peter. God bless you. We're going to get back to the rest of our interview here, but thank you for your breaking news story. You are welcome. Trisha, it's good to hear you that you're on the show. Brenda, I love you. I love you, too. Good to hear that you're on the show as well. And I'd also just like to say that when I came to the church, the first person I laid eyes upon was Brenda. (laughs) All right. Very good. Thank you, Peter. God bless. God bless you. Bye, peanut butter cup. (laughs) All right, Brenda. Yeah. Back to you now. Tell us what's going on. Tell us what uh, you have on your heart and on your mind tonight. Well, I just, a lot's going on, really. Um, You know, I'm dealing with a lot with my, what my daughter's going through. Um, It's been hard because, like, before she went in, she was a different person. And I didn't realize how much they go through over there. Um. I've not only talked to her, but I've talked to other veterans that are going through the same thing with a post-traumatic mm-hmm. stress disorder, TBI, but hers is so much more, you know, um, mm-hmm. it's just struggling, you know, um, money wise, she's struggling, and I know that um, we have a homeless shelter in Boyna Park, and I love that, and I've tried to get her to come back there, but it's hard for them to deal with the people all around you all the time are going to bed at nine o'clock. I can't and do it. She just can't do it. And uh, she's not I the only one. There's to so many more that are sleeping on the sidewalks because they cannot deal with all being around a bunch of people. They just need their time and space. And, you know, and we just, you know, it's hard for me too because I'm so used to just like, come on, let's, let's do something or let's get this done. And sometimes she's, doesn't want to do it, you know, but we it's getting better. We've been going through a lot of different things that the veterans saying. They've been helping her out a little bit more. Kind of upset because a lot of them claim to have the funds to help them and emergency aid, but yet she's still struggling and um, homeless and because of this. And like I said, it's not due to not being able to come back at the shelter. It's just to do what she's going through. Amen. And, well, know, Brenda, thank you so much. We're running a little bit out of time here. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry to do that. <laughs> but uh, we do thank you for uh, watching and listening. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on location. Uh, I'm not at my favorite location for uh, own location, uh, but... Uh, that's usually Starbucks. <laughs> I've done more shows from Starbucks, I think, that I think that I have from my studio. But I remembered that uh, my wife of 48 years, one month and 14 days, Barbara Juliana Stevens, uh, loved Southern California. She was a valley girl. She lived in the San Fernando Valley, but she loved Orange County. And she used to tell me one of the reasons I love Orange County is because we can take a drive out not too far from our home, go into a small town, 
by the name of Orange and go around the traffic circle and stop at an old-fashioned drugstore and soda fountain. And uh, she loved that because her grandma and grandpa used to tell her when she didn't know anything about fountain drinks or soda fountains, they would tell her, yeah, they remembered the old drugstore. And when we came here the first time, golly, 25, 27 years ago, she said, honey, stop. I said, why, why? She said, pull over and stop. And so we pulled over and stopped. And I went in the back and parked, and I came. She said, baby, you got to see this. She took me inside here at Watson's Drugstore that's been here since 1899, yeah. a long time. And she said, look at here. Here is a typical drugstore that my grandma and grandpa used to talk about, soda fountains. So we yeah. bellied up to the bar and ordered ourselves uh, a soda, a sarsaparilla and soda there at the uh, uh, bar, really, of, of the fountain. And it is a drugstore. There's places to shop inside, tables to sit if you want to eat, tables outside, which is where we're at today. In fact, before we go off... Maybe you should say drugstore. Yeah, they, 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 may, they may decide, Wiley, is that the drugstore? Well, i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the camera off me, and I'm going to put the camera, first of all, on the street. And you're going to see we're seated right here. Oh, whoops, if I can get out of here without falling down. Uh, and we are here, right here on the street, uh, on Chapman Avenue, uh, near the drugstore. Uh, and there's Brenda and Trish. That's where we had dinner. Boy, I tell you what, I had some old-fashioned, home-style uh, vegetable beef stew a while ago. And it was a real treat. Uh, and uh, they had a... They had a Watson burger and, and fries and, and uh, Ortega burger, yeah. And this, this is where if you come to Watson's, you can come and sit out here on the street corner and maybe even uh, see an accident like we saw tonight. But as you will see, the uh, police department of uh, uh, Orange is doing their job. And so we are here. And we are here at the Watson's Drugstore. And we're going to go over here where we can see the sign again. And you can see this is the sign. Watson's established 1899. Uh, Watson's is the oldest drugstore in Orange County, located at the plaza in the center of town of Orange. The inside and outside of Watson's have been used to film many movies. And now, the Wiley Drake Show. So I'm going to ask Brenda or Trish to open the door for me so I can get inside. And we're going to see a lady here that has been here. How many years have you been here, dear? Sixteen years. Sixteen. Tell us your name, please. Jamie. Jamie. Hey, I have a daughter named Jamie. So I'll remember your name. God bless you and thank you. For serving here at Watson's for 16 years. All right. And uh, this is the inside of the, quote, drug store. We're going to make our way back here uh, just for a little bit. I'll not put anybody on camera that don't want to be on camera. But this is the uh, reason for this store. There's the drug store. But here is the shopping area. Everything from name tags to candy. And, boy, some of the best candy and some of the greatest carrot cake slice and uh, beautiful chocolate cake. Unbelievable. Uh, great, great.